So, th- Sarah, thanks for making the time to speak with me this morning again. And obviously, as a co-founder of Tuck and the creator of Sarah's Attic and a familiar face to lots of us from the BBC, as a maker, as a creative, what, where do you get your inspiration from? What drives you? What makes you do what you do? Um, I just love what I do because I'm being creative with what you said. I mean, I've always been creative even since I was like a, a young child, really. You know, I, I've always been making things. I've always been a very practical person. What I do now is basically working with old bits of furniture. Or I love working with old things. I love also the environmental um, impact. Well, not impact that we're having. Yeah, so sort of reducing the impact yeah. and the footprint. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what, what does it feel like when you've transformed something, when you've upcycled it and it's completely different to how you started or it's that wow moment, you know, some of the pieces you've done w- with the BBC on Money for Nothing. Money for Nothing, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. You know, some of those pieces have been absolutely stunning. And how does that feel? What is that, you know, emotionally for you or that type of thing rather than the sort of physicality of it? I think the whole um, thing with upcycling or taking something that's old, a bit worn, a bit battered, needing to be, you know, upgraded and, you know, restyled, it just gets so much reward from it because you are making something old that wasn't being used into something new that people can actually use again. I mean, I think actually the best thing I like is when I'm working on commissions and you can get, you know, maybe somebody's brought you an old chair that she can actually remember sitting in it when she was, you know, or a grandchild when she was 60 odd years ago. And she, it just holds so much sentimental value to her. And then she'll bring yeah. it to me. It doesn't look great. And then when she comes to collect it, she's in tears because it's just been transformed. So that is just so rewarding to get that kind of, you know, well, to get a reaction like that. Yeah. So it's it's partly you're doing good for the environment and the planet, if you like. Mm-hmm. Partly that as you upcycle something, but particularly on commission work, that you've got that sort of emotional response from what you do as you give things literally new breath of life, I guess. Yeah, you do. And I think it's also, there is a bit of a responsibility there too because they've given you a piece of furniture that means a lot to them and you've actually got to do it justice. And that's the kind of tricky bit because there's always a little bit in my mind that says, oh, have I done the right thing? But then when you see the reaction of the customer when they come to collect it, it does actually. It's all worked out so far. (laughs) Well, that's that's good. But I guess, you know, if if it didn't have that challenge in there that sort of sense of risk or danger but probably that's that's probably part of the the whole sense of the drive behind it you know if we do stuff that's so familiar like a normal job you you become desensitized to it i guess whereas i i I think if you're working with people in something that has that um that sense of memory attached to an object um you've always got that responsibility, I guess, to, to make sure that you don't lose that moment, but you're still injecting new life or you're changing something. And, and as we know, we've bought a, a, a couple of items from you and they're, they're lifting you know, our, our fairly modern environment and putting a real something different into it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that a lot of the pieces you have here and, and your other makers that you have, etc really add into so i think you know from our experience what you're doing here through your work and the likes is quite special there's a lot of people doing upcycling but setting up that space for it to be and being a sort of nearly a curation point for people's work as well as a shop as well as you know encouraging people to get into upcycling themselves and then you've got a nice diversity here no, oh, definitely, yeah. And I think as well, I mean, it's, it is good, like you say, to have the diverse range of kind of different styles here too, but it's also, again, going back to the tuck shop, um, giving employment to nearly 35 different makers out there. You know, yeah. they're all getting an income from it as well, so they're getting to kind of create and do something that they really want to do, but also making an income. No, which is, which is great and really important, and, and the only way that that sort of maker sector if you like has got any hope of, of continuing being real because the harsh reality is we've all got to pay the bills we've all got got to to feed ourselves etc and you know even when you can do something that you love you've still got to do that element of putting putting tea on the table shall we say 
definitely. I mean, that's that's always in my, the back of my mind. I am so lucky that I get to do something that I love. But there is, you do have to work hard at it. You know, I'm self-employed. It's not just, you know, Monday to Friday, nine to five. It is hours here, there, everywhere. It's working weekends. But the benefits of being self-employed and being able to do what I want is that I can, basically, <laughs> and yeah. at certain times, do what I want. Which is always great. Yeah, uh-huh. Brilliant. So, Sarah, how long have you been sort of having this freedom in your life? And talk me through starting off, creating Sarah's Attic, moving over to here. Just give us a potted history. Okay, potted history of my my designer life. I actually started way before Sarah's Attic or becoming an upcycler because I've always been interested in design and making. So I've got a first honours degree in ceramic and glass design. Um, which I was so interested in when I was younger. We had a company called Cadenus Glass based in Perth and I was actually a training trainee paperweight maker there uh-huh. from when I was 18. So I worked within a glass house making paperweights out of molten lava for three, four years. And then right. I, I went running off down to London for a boyfriend and lived down there for as, a As you bit. do. As you do, yeah. <laughs> lived down there for a little while, for a few years. And at that time, that's when I went to university and got a degree in ceramics and glass design. Things went a bit pear-shaped down there with the boyfriend, so I came back up here, worked again at Cadenes Glass, but this time I was actually in the design studios, so I was actually designing and making. So I carried on working in the design um, and making industry of glass for well over 20 years, and then started to dabble in upcycling. Well, it's it's an incredibly small world, because one of the things I have from... I guess mid late eighties, which was given to me by the girlfriend as a Christmas <laughs> present, was uh, uh, exactly what you used to make—a Caithness glass paperweight, oh. one of the globe ones. And it's—it's. It's, um, she bought it for me because um, it's got a whirlwind in it. Okay. And yeah. she said she re- that's what I reminded her of. <laughs> that's a good thing. But a small world, you never know. You may have had a hand in that. Yeah. Piece. Mm, that was maybe a bit younger then, I think. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. I think Cadenas Glass, they, in their heydays, in their high times, they were everywhere. They had three, four different factories making different glass products. So right, they, yeah. There was very collectible items. And I was very privileged to be able to work with the company and in that design area. Yeah. And so from that, you moved on and... From that, I basically started upcycling just in a back bedroom. I had old bits of furniture in my house. I actually had a Greaves and Thomas egg chair that was given to my mum when myself and my twin brother were born um, so that she could kind of nurse us on the chair. So it's the same age as me and it was in my house. So 12 years ago, I thought I need I needs to be recovered because it's in a bit of a state and yeah. I hadn't done any kind of form of upholstery before. I hadn't done any kind of up. up upcycling of furniture before but it just needed to be changed so that was my first project and it was quite an advanced project to start on so I yeah, did it quite, it quite brave on an egg chair yeah and it, it was actually quite a success so it kind of went from there that I then continued to make kind of like things for family and friends I had a back bedroom filled with fabric or bits of old furniture so yep. that's how it started it was basically a hobby that then turned into quite a successful business Cool. And then you had your first premises in Perth? Yes. We basically um, had a kind of a concession shop, I suppose, within a bigger shop in Perth. So I would rent a little space in there. And it was really quite good to test the market to see that people liked what I was doing and they actually wanted to buy my pieces. So we were there for about two years and it was a success. For that's when we decided that we would need to find our own premises. So I moved into my own shop and we were there for three years and again it was a great success at that point I'd started working with the BBC as well uh-huh. so that helped business and promoting everything um, yeah no, cool. and then over to here and then over to here yeah uh-huh. so I've been upcycling for probably about 12 years right and now this is where we are in Tayside upcycling and crafting excellent so Sarah obviously um, I mean, you're a face that's well known to people who watch I guess daytime television or iPlayer. Uh-huh. Um, you're a regular contributor and a maker that's uh, on the BBC through uh, Money f- for Nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, you've done some amazing pieces. Thank you. So how did how did that start? Well, how did you get in contact, or did the BBC discover you? They it was they did actually discover me. Well, hey. <laughs> um, I was still in my concession shop, the first shop that I actually had and they had recorded I think one series 
previous. Right. And the production team were just scoping out and trying to find different makers. And they actually discovered my website. They found my Facebook page. So they got in touch with me and just asked if I wanted to be part of the show. So I had to do like, you know, kind of introductory kind of interview thing to make sure I came across okay. And then it's just been from there to there. So Great. And I mean, how many times have you done a piece for that programme now? I think it's been about 35 episodes that I've actually been on. Wow. Now. Yeah, so it's been, it's quite a continuous, I mean, it's been five years, so it's been yeah. quite good. And they do two seasons each year. So the next time I'll probably be on, it's going to be about maybe a couple of months' time, I think. Right, and do you enjoy it or do you find it stressful when the camera crew turns up? I think I would be lying if I didn't think the first few episodes that they recorded I wasn't nervous because I was terrified <laughs> because you kind of think everything you're doing they're filming you know if you make a mistake that's it and sometimes if you're working on something you only get one shot at it and they're actually recording that process so it got quite nerve-wracking but I think now because I've done it for so long now you do get kind of used to it and me and the cameraman Martin are just, we're like friends now so it just yeah. makes it it makes it far more relaxing just far more enjoyable and I love it yeah and I mean knowing these crews that the BBC send out for some of these programmes, they're not as big as you might think as a crew. <laughs> no, there's only me and Martin, that's it, so it's quite good. So it's yeah. just like mucking about with your friend and there just happens to be a camera there and you've got to do things two or three times, you know, to get it on record. Yeah, get the, get the right take. <laughs> Have no sneezes in the middle. Exactly, yeah. Or annoying yeah. garages peeping their horns in the background. I know. Yeah, exactly, our car's but going. That's your. that's the work environment you're in. It is, yeah, and we can't control whatever they do next door. <laughs> So now that you're a bit more familiar with being behind the camera, oh, in front of the camera, not behind the camera, <laughs> um, is it something you're enjoying or do you still find it, you know, unnatural? No, I, I actually, I really do enjoy it now. Um, you do, you kind of get to a kind of stage when you kind of forget the camera's actually even there. And because you're doing, you're actually doing something that you love doing, which is my bits of wood or you know upholstering yeah. a chair it's just quite easy really and I do quite enjoy the projects that I get from money for nothing because you do have to think completely outside the box it's not like working on a chair that somebody brings you because that's usually the kind of same kind of thing but because it's for the TV it's money for nothing you have to I think create something that you know it's mind-blowing you know or yeah. as near to that as you can get <laughs> no indeed uh, it, it needs uh, the wow factor yeah. and the transformation factor mm-hmm. and it's probably nice to be involved in something where you've you've kind of got that nearly complete freedom whereas you're not trying to meet somebody else's expectations what happens with the piece exactly yeah other than hopefully get it sold one way or another yeah yeah that's that's definitely it there is there is complete freedom it is just it's somewhere i think that i can go to kind of take the next stage of my designing because you have you are kind of learning a new process for instance you know I'll try different things I've never tried before because I kind of feel like well I've got to but then it's good it makes you grow I think yeah so no disasters so far then none so far (laughs) no they've all they've all kind of been okay I mean some some of them might take a bit longer than what you think because they film the process and they leave you and then you're left here to actually complete the job and some of those jobs have taken quite a while to get to the finished process so you know fine well in reality if you're actually you know making that for a customer they couldn't afford it because it'd just be too costly yeah but I should have really said that because that's a secret (laughs) I should (laughs) we might have to cut that piece out (laughs) no it's okay (laughs) cool um and I think that's quite a nice segue so obviously when they first you first started working with the BBC um you had I'll say your own premises, not that these aren't your premises. Um, and then you've moved over to Tuck. Um, tell us a little bit more about what's different between Sarah's Attic and Tuck, what you're, what you're really doing with that new brand. Um, yeah, Tuck is completely different. I mean, it was basically founded by my husband, Alfie. Um, when we had the shop in Perth, which was just my shop, that was just me selling my pieces, upcycling furniture and whatever else. But Tayside Upcycling and Craft Centre is completely different just because it is a not-for-profit community interest company, for one thing. Yeah. And the whole ethos of the business is to stop things going to landfill. And also to show people what they can do with old pieces of furniture. You don't have to throw things out. You know, we can either 
show you what to do or we can do it for you. We're going to be starting workshops so they can learn themselves. You know, we've got all the paint and everything here that they can go home with and do their own project. So it's a completely different setup from what I had before. We did see uh, um, when I did have the shop, we had a number of different upcyclers would come in and buy paint from me. So yeah. we knew there was people out there that wanted to do something. So we knew that we would be able to fill this place with different upcyclers doing different things, working in different mediums. Yeah, and you've got a very large number of people coming in and, and, and putting their product and their outcomes here. Yeah, yeah, I think it's probably about 35 different makers now, yeah. all in doing, using different products, whether it's furniture or it could be upcycling wood, it could be upcycling metal, upcycling glass bottles. So it's, just, it's really just a diverse mix of different media. Yeah, I mean, literally anything from chairs and, and cupboards and chest of drawers through to uh, recycled, as you say, recycled bot prop, um, bottles with you know copper tubing around them and yeah. really modern funky lights mm -hmm. to clocks made out of spare parts from bicycles, yeah. uh -huh. um, taking scrap pieces of wood and carving them. I mean, there's a huge diversity of, of the products that you've got here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and fairly consistently um, rotating through. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when something gets sold, that's it, it's gone. You know, yeah. it's not going to be repeated. So we like that, you know, having these kind of unique one-off pieces, if you like. Um, it's just, yeah, I think that our customer base gets it as well. They're looking for that statement piece. They're looking for something that is going to give them the wow factor in their house. They want something that's a bit different, not just your run-of-the-mill typical you know high street kind of brand kind of thing and they can see yeah. what we're doing here it is older pieces of furniture and we are trying to stop things I mean how we measure the success of the business is how much we stop going to landfill yeah and how many tons did you prevent last year last year well I know that we sold three tons of furniture in January alone in January yeah. alone yeah. yeah so I'd have to look at my figures to get the exact amount of how much we sold last year but yeah. Uh, it's, it's tons, yeah. And then, I mean, you've got a few pieces of furniture here and I believe you've got other sheds and warehouses full of bits waiting for someone's special touch to go over them. <laughs> we do. I mean, because we're a community interest company, we get donations of furniture. So sometimes if pieces are a bit, bit kind of broken or bashed or need some repairs, the charity shops won't take them just because they want something they can sell on quite quickly so those pieces come to us because we're going to be breaking them down or we're going to be sanding them or fixing them up and painting them so we get so much and it's very kind we absolutely love our donations but it is taken over like my workshop it's taken over the shop now as well and we have the off-site storage too yeah and I, I believe you've sort of been able to actually employ somebody as, as sort of your first employee and the things are growing yeah yeah we've now got um, an upcycling ambassador called diva and she's fantastic she's actually a graduate from dundee university where she's um, graduated in textile design and surface pattern and she's fantastic she helps out in the back now here too so she does her own upcycling um, pieces of furniture and makes cushions and does lots of different things and also is very good with all the customers that come in the shop so it's great to have that third person here brilliant but thank you for your time this morning. <laughs> thank you. It's been good. Yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. And um, maybe we'll get some of your other creatives in at some point and uh, get their stories. Yeah, I'm sure they'd be really happy to speak to you. Great. Well, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>